So uh, welcome everyone to this week's Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor uh, Bart Besseling, who is an assistant professor with the Bernoulli Institute for Mathematics and Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence at University of Groningen in the Netherlands. So something about Bart, he received his Master of Science uh, in Mechanical Engineering uh, and then the PhD uh, in 2012, both from Eindhoven University of Technology. He was then uh, uh, for a short period a visiting researcher with the Tokyo Institute of Technology in Japan. And then he spent uh, four years uh, in, uh, in Stockholm as a postdoctoral researcher uh, at KTH. His research interests are on the mathematical system theory for large scale interconnected systems with a particular emphasis on contract-based design and control, compositional analysis, model reduction, and applications typically in, engineer in intelligent transportation systems and uh, neuromorphic computing. Also notably is a recipient of the 2020 Automatica Paper Prize. Today's talk is uh, titled Modular Analysis of Linear Systems Using Assumed Guarantee Contracts. And this touches many of the interests we have uh, in, this, uh, in this audience. And therefore, I'm very excited to hear more and, and give you the stage part. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also, thanks a lot for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, and during this talk, feel free to interrupt me at, at any point if you have any, um, any questions. I'll be happy to, uh, to take questions. So indeed, so this talk is on modular analysis of linear systems using assumed guarantee contracts. And it is a, a topic that I've gotten very interested in since, since a few years. Um, this specific work is um, mostly done with uh, my PC student, Brian Chali, and also in collaboration with Arjan van der Schaft, both uh, in Groningen. Um, but I've also, I also have collaborations on this topic with uh, collaborators from Groningen as well as, as KTH. And um, our modern engineered world is becoming increasingly complex, which provides some motivation for, for this work. And this leads to various challenges. And the first one is that these systems are typically subject to complex specifications, where I was trained, let's say, as a classical control uh, theorist. Um, these, these current specifications become so complex that you can wonder whether they can still be reasonably uh, handled by traditional uh, control specifications, such as stability, robustness, passivity, and, and the like. Um, another feature of these systems is that they are large scale, interconnected and heterogeneous, um, which means that the, well, the design and control of such systems becomes incredibly complex. And in my view, one way to, to deal with this, maybe the only way to deal with this, is to develop methods that are inherently modular, meaning that we can split up the analysis and design into the analysis and design of individual components rather than the system as, as a whole. And to illustrate this a, a bit further, um, let's look at this, this very simple uh, small example of one integrated system that comprises five components. And it has maybe some external input and external output. And possibly this is, uh, let's say, an electric car that we would like to design. And the components could be uh, a battery, an electric motor, and maybe some mechanical parts. Uh, connecting to the, uh, well, representing the, the drivetrain. And ultimately, we would like this integrated system to satisfy a certain specification. And I've indicated these uh, lines here to, well, to emphasize that the specification should really be on its input-output behavior. Um, however, the design of these systems is, is very complex. So what we'd rather do is forget about this overall specification consider one component in isolation and do the design of this one component according to a local specification, right? So if I'm a, a battery expert and I'm designing the, the battery or I'm controlling the, the battery, I'd like to do this when only looking at a specification on the battery. And this way I don't have to talk to my uh, colleagues who are experts in, in the electric motors because they might be in a different building or even in a, in a different country. So this really would allow for the independent design of, of components. Right? So do this design with respect to a local specification. Um, of course, if everybody does this, then ultimately we will obtain an integrated system 
which satisfies some integration of the specifications that we used for component design. But, and then uh, a major question is, of course, do, does this interaction of these specifications satisfy the overall specification? But still, this is the um, reasoning that, that I would like to explore, because this really enables a separation of concerns, where first of all, um, local system design or control design can be done according to local specifications, and reasoning about the interconnection only needs to be done on specification level, right? in such a way that correctly designed specifications lead to satisfaction of the overall specification. And as these specifications are typically on a much higher level of abstraction than the actual components, this is um, much more feasible than directly designing the overall integrated system with respect to this uh, global specification. And this is especially true if you think that um, this approach can even be done in a hierarchical manner where we maybe, well, subdivide system four in yet more components. And so this is the type of reasoning that I would like to explore throughout this, this talk. Um, but maybe first we should have a, a brief look at what we mean by, by specifications. And if you take a look at, well, let's say classical systems and control theory, um, and uh, you're maybe in a very pessimistic mood, then you might claim that there's only, uh, well, roughly two approaches for dealing with, with specifications, where one is, uh, well, the very elegant uh, theory of, of dissipativity theory, uh, which can be used to reason about things like stability, robustness, passivity, um, uh, and, and the like. Uh, and another set of, of theories is related to set invariance, which is typically connected to, to safety properties. And these two theories, well, they're even closely linked. Uh, you can think of Lyapunov uh, theory, for example. Um, of course, exactly this observation that maybe this is, is uh, that there are some limitations to this, to these theories have led to developments of well, formal methods, uh, which are very applicable to express very rich specifications, but they come at the cost that they typically require discretization of, of the underlying system and are therefore not directly applicable to, to very large scale systems. So in today's talk, I would like to ex well, explore an, an alternative, which is uh, contract theory, which is not so much a, a single theory, but more well, uh, you could almost say a philosophy for reasoning about composition um, and modular design. And it was originally developed in the, in the field of, of computer science, uh, specifically in software engineering, when it was then quickly picked up by people working on, on formal methods. And it has uh, received some following also in, let's say, the cyber physical systems design uh, community. Um, so since this originated from computer science, also, the applications in cyber physical systems design are very much approached from the cyber side, if you uh, if you like. Um, whereas in this talk, I would like to focus maybe more on the on the physical side. But still, there is a, a nice um, uh, set of theories for this, uh, and this has even led to well, what is called the contract meta theory, which is described in this uh, this very nice book by Ben Veniste and, and others, um, and it basically describes the ingredients that a contract theory should have. Um, and we'll say a little bit more about these ingredients in, um, in a moment. Um, but these ideas from contract theory have recently also received some, some following in systems and control theory, um, but they're still very closely linked to all well, these classical properties of, of dissipativity and, and set invariance. Now, of course, there's also a body of work which is more closely linked to, to formal methods and symbolic control. But they again have this, this drawback of typically requiring some kind of discretization of, of our state space. So in this talk, I would like to have a, well, maybe a fresh look at, at these systems and directly start with continuous time control systems. And I would like to develop a notion of contract or contract theory for these continuous time control systems that express rich specifications on the dynamics of such systems. This is something different from dissipativity or, or set invariance. Um, at the same time, and this is the main motivation, this, these, or this contract theory should allow for modular analysis and design by enabling compositionality. And I would also like it to in instantiate 
is meta theory because it, this provides a very elegant uh, framework. So this um, brings me to the outline of the, the remainder of this talk, where I'll first talk a little bit about the requirements that such contract theory should have before introducing the specific behavioral assumed guarantee contracts um, that we've been working on. We discuss some properties of this and I'll, I'll close with an example and, and some conclusions. Um, but first look at the uh, requirements that such contract theory should have. So this is just a smaller picture of, um, of the figure that I showed before, where I now call the specifications C for contracts. Uh, so a contract is nothing more than, than a specification. And in order to reason about, well, this, this modular design, of course, a few notions are, are needed. And clearly we need some notion of contract implementation. And we need to be able to say, when does a system sigma implement or satisfy a specification C1? Right, so this is a notion that we, that we would have to, um, to develop. Uh, another notion that we would like um, is a notion of contract comparison, right, where we will be able to compare different specifications. In the literature, this goes under the name of, of refinement, and it's basically defined by the property that if my contract C is a stricter specification than my contract C prime, and my system implements the strict specification, then it should also implement the uh, well more relaxed specification, uh, which is a property that seems very uh, very natural. So also this notion of refinement is something that we like to to develop. And then the third one is a notion of composition, which needs to have the property that if my system sigma one implements contract C one, and my system sigma two implements a contract C two then the interconnection of these two systems satisfies the interconnection of these two contracts. And these interconnection of these two contracts, C1 and C2, is itself a contract, which will be known by C1 cross C2. Right? And it should have the property, well, it should have the property that I, that I stated here. And so this C1 cross C2 is itself a contract that combines C1 and C2. And this is basically all that's needed to enable this uh, separation of concerns that I uh, discussed earlier. And so in particular, now if I want to do design, I need to design my components according to their local specifications. And I need to check whether the integration of these local specifications refines the overall specification, C dot. If both of these things hold, then it is guaranteed that well, the interconnection of my two components satisfies the overall specification. Right? And this line is really the, the main idea. This is really the main reasoning that, um, that I would like to, to follow. Okay. Um, so um, these are the, the key ingredients for a, for a contract theory. Of course, if you think a little bit further, there's maybe a few other requirements that we'd like to, to satisfy as well. And the first one is more of an observation, and it is that these contracts should really be specifications on the external behavior of such component. And what I mean by this is that we're not so much interested in the exact details of the implementation of Sigma 1, but we're only interested in how it interacts with other components. And it's really this interaction that is the the key. Um, and moreover, we would like to have that all the notions that we develop should, of course, be verifiable. They should be practically uh, tractable. And in this talk, I'll well uh, focus on, let's say, classical uh, control theory and look at the linear state-based systems that, we all, uh, that we're all very familiar with. Um, so this is a standard uh, LTI systems, which I like to view as some kind of system with inputs U and outputs Y. And as I said, we're really interested in the external behavior, so the behavior in terms of U and Y, rather than the details of the system itself. So we're not so much interested in state trajectories, but only on how this system interacts with other systems. And this motivates us to define the external behavior, which is really nothing more than all the trajectories U and Y that satisfy the dynamics. 
right? So that is what this external behavior represents. Um, one nice thing about defining these behaviors is that it allows for different representations. And it is a well-known result that such behavior can be equivalently expressed in this form, where now instead of looking at the state space equations, we represent the relation between the input U and the output Y through these matrices P and Q. And these P and Q are polynomial matrices with, with certain properties. And maybe an example on the next slide will, will make clear what, uh, what I mean um, by this. But ultimately, P and Q are uh, matrices of, of polynomials. Uh, and um, the, these have, have two properties. First one, that P is square and invertible, and that P inverse Q is a proper rational matrix. So from now on, rather than looking at these standard state space systems, we consider this representation with this P and Q matrices. And we take this P and Q representation to be in input output form, which is just another way of saying that these conditions one and two hold. Still what we have in mind um, is really, well, the standard state based systems that, that we're all very familiar with. Um, so, okay, this is, this is just a repetition of the, the systems that, that we're interested in. And just to give a very tiny example to get a little bit of feeling for, for how this works is a, a simple mass spring damper system. These are dynamics that uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with. So the input U is a force acting on this mass spring damper system. Y is the position of, of the mass. And in my Newton's laws, you get this uh, well second order equation. Right, and the second order equation will write in, in this form. Uh, where rather than uh, writing y dot for differentiation, we introduce a differentiation operator. So we write it in this form over here, and this uh, immediately gives us um, the P and Q matrices, which in this case are nothing more than, than polynomials. Right? So um, people are sometimes uh, intimidated by, by this, uh, this notation of behavioral systems theory, but in my view, there's really not much to it. Um, so Still, we use this language of behavioral system theory, which is due to uh, uh, Jan Willems, and these two assumptions have, have a nice interpretation. Uh, so the first assumption implies that the input U is free, meaning that for any input signal that, uh, well, that I propose, there exists an output signal such that, uh, well, there's just an output signal generated by the, by the system. And this is typically what we have in these uh, in state-based systems as well. And the second one is related to uh, the system being non-anticipating, but this, this is of less uh, importance. Uh, maybe one remark is that even though we study, uh, well, trajectories in terms of U and Y, this representation does still capture autonomous behavior because the autonomous behavior is nothing more than all these signals Y in the behavior for zero input. Um, so this is what, um, this is what we will use. And um, one nice thing about using these behaviors is that you can compare them. There's a very clear notion of, of comparison. So I look at a slightly simpler case when we have a system sigma one with external variable W, so instead of U and Y. And I would like to compare this behavior to the behavior of a system sigma two. And so these behaviors are given in in this specific form using this polynomial matrix R. And then we can characterize when the behavior of system one is included in the behavior of system two, namely if this well, uh, polynomial matrix condition holds. But the key point here is really that we're able to compare these behaviors. Uh, so if this conclusion holds, if this inclusion holds, I should say, then every trajectory of system one is also a trajectory of system two, meaning that system two has richer behavior than system one. And um, okay, so even though I focused on systems in specific form, this is really no restriction. So again, the details are not so important, but what I would like you to take away from this slide is that whenever 
there is some kind of behavioral inclusion, then this is something that can actually be checked algorithmically. Right? So this is something that can be, can be done. Um, then let's now slowly move towards uh, uh, contracts. And one distinguishing feature of, of using contracts is as specifications is that it does not consider a system in isolation, but it considers systems in interaction with its environment. And so we define an environment E, which is itself a uh, linear system defining some behavior, uh, some class of functions U that it can generate. And this will act as the input to our system sigma, the system that we're actually interested in. Right, and of course, later on in the compositional setting, this environment E will comprise of other components. Uh, but for now, we view this as an, an abstract environment, which just uh, en well, encapsulates the fact that we're interested in the behavior of this sigma, but only for relevant environments, right? So for only for a class of uh, a space of, of inputs U. So specifically, it means that we will be interested in the behavior of this interconnection, which is given by, by this equation. And this has an external behavior, well, which is nothing more than all uy's that can be generated by this interconnection. Um, and using this, we can finally move to, uh, to contracts. Uh, so uh, a contract itself, is a pair of systems. And these systems we call assumptions and, and guarantees. And assumptions are linear systems that generate inputs U, whereas guarantees are linear systems that specify a relation between U and Y uh, in a very similar way as, um, as, well, let's say normal systems do. Uh, so as I said, so they're themselves linear dynamical systems and they define an input behavior in the case of assumptions, meaning that it only relates to U's and an external behavior in terms of U and Y for the guarantees, which hopefully is clear from, uh, from this figure. So um, now we come to the, the main definition of, of a contract. Uh, so assume a contract C is given. Uh, in this case, we say that an environment E is compatible with the contract if the behavior of E satisfies the assumptions, uh, meaning that any trajectory in E um, satisfies the assumptions, uh, which are indicated as, as such. And note that this is nothing more than a behavioral inclusion again, so this is something that we can check. But maybe more importantly, this now also uh, allows us to define what it means for a system to implement a certain contract. Because we say that our system sigma implements a certain contract C if this system interconnected with any compatible environment satisfies the guarantees. Uh, and again, this is specified in terms of behavioral inclusion. And so this is what it looks like uh, uh, in a picture. And of course, since the assumptions are themselves linear systems, we might replace the environment with the assumptions itself. And you can easily prove that a system implements a contract if and only if uh, the interconnection with assumptions and the system satisfies the guarantees. Right, so this um, interconnection of both assumptions and guarantees is, is crucial in this, in this definition. And this is also where it departs from or well, the classical definitions um, in uh, dissipativity theory, for example, uh, where you don't explicitly make assumptions on the environment in which you will operate. Um, moreover, this is a well a very different way of, of specifying, uh, of placing specifications, because it's really specifications on dynamic behavior. I remember that both the assumptions and guarantees are themselves dynamical systems. And so this potentially allows for expressing rich dynamics right? in the sense that you really specify dynamics. Um, I'll not make any claims that this is um, uh, 
better or, or more general than, than distributivity or, or set invariance. It's just an, an alternative uh, perspective that, that I would like to explore and that I think is, is interesting. Um, maybe as a final remark here, again, this is all based on, on behavioral um, inclusions. So this is something that, that we can verify for, uh, for a given system. Um, okay, so let's uh, have a look at some properties of, of contracts. And maybe going back, the first um, question you may have is given uh, a contract, so given assumptions and guarantees, yeah, does there even exist a system sigma that implements it? And this um, leads to the notion of, of consistency, where we call a contract consistent if, well, there exists at least one, one implementation. And one thing that you can see is that this system sigma has no influence over u. So any u, any input that the assumptions can generate should already be in the guarantees. Otherwise, this inclusion never holds. And this is, in fact, a necessary condition for, uh, for implementation. So we have this small result that says that our contract is consistent only if the, well, the use generated by the assumptions are somehow accepted by the guarantees. And so they're contained in the input behavior of the guarantees, where the input behavior is nothing more than all the use that can be matched with some y in the behavior of, of the guarantees. Um, you can find um, also necessary and sufficient uh, conditions, um, but the conditions that we have are very technical and, and do not give much, uh, much insight, so we'll not go into, into details. Um, instead, I would like to make uh, another observation, and that is that different sets of assumptions and guarantees could lead to the same contract in the sense that they have the same set of environments and, and implementations. Again, when looking at this, um, you see, can see that the assumptions generate a certain class of inputs. So that basically means that everything that the guarantees say about inputs that are not within the class generated by the assumptions is somehow irrelevant for our definition. And so we can define another contract, C prime, which gives us the guarantees, but restricted only to the inputs that are in the assumptions. And if we now compare these contracts C and C prime, then they have exactly the same sets of environments and implementations. And so we can play around a little bit with the form of these, of these guarantees without loss of, of generality. And so this is a small uh, observation that will become uh, useful later because uh, a more relevant aspect of, of this is the notion of, of contract refinement. And it allows to compare the, well, compare two contracts. And the definition is as, as follows. It says that a contract C prime refines a contract C, and we said you know about this inequality. If first of all, every compatible environment of this contract C is compatible with C prime, uh, which basically means that the, the set of compatible environments uh, of C prime is larger than that of C. Uh, and for implementations, the, uh, the other implication needs to hold. Uh, so any implementation of C prime is an implementation of C. Uh, so um, when uh, looking at this definition in text, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to parse, um, but the interpretation is is as follows. So it says that C prime gives a stricter requirement than C because it provides stricter guarantees. And so it has, um, you could say, a smaller set of, of guarantees, while at the same time allowing for a larger class of environments. And so C prime is stricter in, in these two ways. Um, I hope that, um, uh, that this is clear. Um, so mathematically, uh, you can state this in terms of, of these behaviors again. So, of course, the fact that um, every compatible environment of C is compatible with C prime is nothing more than this first mathematical implement, uh, uh, implication. 
uh, on the on the compatible environments. And the second line that every implementation of C prime is an implementation of C, well, is this implication over here, right? So for any sigma that uh, that implements the first contract, it should be an implementation of the second contract. Um, okay, so this is just um, a repetition of uh, of the bottom two lines on the on the previous slide, um, but we can very nicely uh, characterize this. Um, I think from the first point, it is very clear that uh, we need to have that the um, assumptions of C are contained in the assumptions of C prime, uh, where C prime is the a stricter contract which needs to set to allow for a larger class of of environments right so we have that if c prime is consistent then it refines c if and only if this condition holds and together with this condition on the guarantees i remember that we would like to encapsulate the fact that um, c prime has stricter guarantees but we need to compare this only for the class of inputs that we may expect, right? So you see here this, this interaction between A and the assumptions and guarantees again in a very similar manner as what I showed on the, on the previous slide. Um, but again, this is something that we can, we can check. And so given two contracts C and C prime, uh, we can clearly define what it, or we can check when one, when one, sorry, when one contract refines the other. Um, okay, and by definition, this immediately gives us the property that, that we were after, right? So if our system implements the strict one, it also uh, implements the, well, the more relaxed one. And this is a direct consequence of the definition that we, that we chose. And so this is the first property that we were after. And the second property is that of, of composition. And we start by um, looking at a, at a series composition. And we ask the following question. So assume that sigma one implements a contract C1 and system sigma two implements a contract C2, then which contract is actually implemented by the series interconnection of these two, of these two systems, right? So this is really a bottom-up question. So given local contra uh, contracts, what is the global contract that is satisfied? And this new global contract is now with respect to input U and output Y. And in the same spirit as before, this means that we look at an environment that we connect to this series interconnection. And this allows us to state the, um, the following definition, which says that um, if, well, we assume that these contracts are, are consistent and that a series composition is the smallest contract that satisfies the following implication. First of all, if we assume that both systems satisfy their respective contracts and our environment is compatible with our composed contract, then we must have two properties. First of all, that the environment to any of the local subsystems is compatible with its local contract. And moreover, that the interconnection of these two systems satisfies our newly defined series composition. So this seems like a very indirect way of, um, of defining uh, composition, but it's actually a definition that well, encapsulates the properties that we would like to have. And so we're defining this. Um, is contract C1 to C2. Right? So this is a series composition. And um, maybe a few remarks. So this talks about the smallest contract with these two properties. And smallest here uh, is with respect to refinement. You can show that refinement is a pre-order, which means that this is the strictest requirement possible on this series composition. Um, OK, so let's try to, uh, let's try to characterize it. And um, the characterization is, uh, uh, is as follows. So remember that one of the conditions is that also in this series composition, 
whatever enters one of my subsystems must satisfy the contract associated to the subsystem. So specifically, if we look at system two, then anything that system one can throw at it should be in the assumptions of system two. Otherwise, we don't know what, what we're doing. Um, so it turns out that it is sufficient to look only at the autonomous behavior of system one. Right, so even if I set E equals zero, then system one can still produce autonomous behavior, right? And this definitely has to be in the assumptions of sigma two, right? It's clear that, that, that this is a, a necessary condition. Um, what is surprising and maybe nice is that this condition is also sufficient. Then it's the condition that I've stated over here. So this says exactly uh, what I just explained, that the autonomous behavior generated by, uh, that can be generated by system one, namely the autonomous behavior in the guarantees of system one is contained in the assumptions of system two. And if this condition holds, then we also have an explicit expression for the uh, series composed contract. And it comprises two parts uh, where the second part, the guarantees are maybe the easiest to interpret. These are nothing more than the guarantees of well, both systems interconnected in this specific way. And the interconnection is exactly the same as, as this one. Um, and the assumptions are, are as follows. So the assumptions comprise two parts. The first one is that, well, the assumptions should definitely uh, well, be smaller than the assumptions of sigma one, right? Because everything that E throws at sigma one should directly be in the assumptions of, of sigma one. But there, it should also satisfy uh, the assumptions of system two, that is A2 star, which can be uh, thought of as the assumptions of system two that are somehow pulled back through system one on this, well, uh, to relate to, to this environment uh, again. All right, so um, uh, I, I could say a little bit more about, about the details, but I, I hope that this intuition is, um, uh, is clear. Um, but what is um, more importantly, or what is more important is again, that these assumptions and guarantees can be constructed explicitly. All right, so this is all, let's say operational in the sense that we can do this. Um, and by the definition of this notion of, uh, of composition, it directly has this desirable property that if system one implements C1, system two implements C2, then the series composition of these components implements our newly defined uh, series composed contract. Right, and um, one other property that we have, again, also by definition, is that this notion of composition plays along very nicely with this notion of refinement in the sense that if we refine one of these two contracts, then well, the interconnection of the refined contracts also refines the original interconnection. Right? And this is due to the fact that we chose this, well, this uh, very indirect definition for, for composition, which is basically this meta theory definition. Um, so we can do something similar for um, uh, for a, a ser or sorry for a feedback interconnection, um, but in view of time, I think I will um, I will skip this um, because the reasoning is is very similar, uh, but the conditions become more uh, uh, more involved. Um, the ideas are are very much the same uh, though, uh, so I'd like to skip this this feedback composition and maybe. Um, take a little pause at, at this point um, to recap what, what we've done. Uh, so um, I've introduced so far uh, a notion of contracts uh, based on behavioral system theory with a notion of implementation, which you can check, a notion of refinement, which you can also check, and a notion of, of composition. Thus, I've only shown the series one, uh, but we can also do parallel and feedback interconnections in, in a similar way. Um, one other question you may have is, can you enforce multiple specifications on a single component? 
Right? So this is another uh, question that, that we could, uh, could have. So for example, if we have one component, which is the, the battery in, in our electric vehicle, we might have a specification on, I don't know, the thermal dynamics of this battery uh, and a specification on how it interacts with, with an electric motor, maybe more from the uh, electrical point of view. So what we would like to have is, well, some notion of a system satisfying two contracts at the same time. And we would like to somehow gather these two contracts in a single new contract. And this leads to the definition of, of conjunction. So we say that the conjunction of these two contracts is the largest contract that refines both C1 and C2. Not any interpretation is the one, sorry, that I just gave, that we would like to fuse these specifications into a single contract. Um, so this can um, uh, be done by introducing what is known as the join of, of the assumptions, which is another linear system, which has the property, and this is the only property that is of importance, is that the behavior of this, uh, this join of these assumptions is exactly the, well, the, uh, the sum of the behaviors of these two individual assumptions. And in a similar way, we can define the meat of, of the guarantees, which gives us the behavior that is the behavior that is contained in both the guarantees of six, sigma one and sigma two, uh, gamma one, gamma two, sorry. And then um, uh, we can express the conjunction of these two contracts, C1 and C2, um, and we can show that it is exactly the, um, uh, the join of the assumptions and the meat of the guarantees under the condition that well, one of these two assumptions holds, either that the uh, assumptions are the same for these two systems or that the guarantees are the same. And so there, um, uh, it's only under these cases that we can, uh, that we can show this. Um, but still, by definition, we have that if our system implements this conjunction, then it also implements C1 and C2 individually, right? And this enables taking into account multiple viewpoints in, in design. So to, um, to close, I would like to have a look at, at an example to maybe illustrate the, the type of reasoning that, uh, yeah, that we would like to enable with, with this contract theory. And the example is one of, um, of a vehicle following system where we assume that we're controlling the second vehicle and we would like it to follow the first vehicle. So in the setup of, of this contract theory, we view the second vehicle as our system, our system sigma, that's the system that we would like to design or, or control. And this first vehicle is really the environment for it. And um, the uh, signals U and Y contain the position and velocity of the first vehicle in U, and the position and velocity of the second vehicle in Y. And the objective that we have here is, is a simple one, which is that the difference of uh, imposition between the two vehicles should be proportional to the velocity of the second vehicle. Uh, and this is something that we'd like to achieve asymptotically. Uh, so, um, uh, this expression equals zero is, is sometimes referred to as a constant headway spacing policy for uh, first such vehicles. Um, and um, so this is our objective. So this should be part of our guarantees. And specifically what we can do is define some desired dynamics. So we want this to go to zero asymptotically. So one way to guarantee this is to ask for well, this, let's say, spacing error to satisfy the simple first order linear dynamics. And so the time derivative of the spacing error is minus k times the spacing error itself. And this is what we would like to, to guarantee. And so this leads to our system gamma, the guarantees, which, well, now takes this form, right? And what I have written here is really nothing more than this differential equation as you remember that y is p1, uh, sorry, p2v2, and u is p1v1. 
Right, so this is really the same, uh, uh, just an alternative, well, just written uh, alternatively. Um, so these are the guarantees that we would like to, to satisfy. Then let's talk about the assumptions that we can make on our environment. And we basically don't want to make any assumptions at all, but well, we know for sure that this first vehicle is going to satisfy the kinematic relation. And so there is a relation between position and, and velocity, and it's captured in, in these assumptions. So these are the assumptions that we make on, on the environment. So now in this case, uh, we propose uh, a model for uh, our vehicle sigma, uh, which here is um, uh, basically a second order uh, model. This is basically Newton's law with F, the force uh, exerted on this vehicle through some controller. And this is the controller that, that I propose. And so together, this gives uh, some dynamical system relating inputs U to outputs Y. And um, my claim is that this system now implements this contract. And so what we would have to do in practice is to check all these conditions. And remember that this behavioral inclusion condition was equivalent to finding a polynomial matrix um, such that, well, the dynamics on the left times this polynomial matrix equals the dynamics on the right. And I will not go into, into much detail, but this is the type of equation that you would have to solve to check this implementation. Okay. Um, so let's, um, let's illustrate this. And I would like to uh, take some dynamics for uh, the lead vehicle. I remember that previously we did not make any assumption on the lead vehicle other than that it satisfies the kinematic relation. Uh, we now assume some specific dynamics. It's again, second order dynamics where L is let's say the force on the first vehicle and it's something that's completely free. Right, so we can push the first vehicle around. Okay. Um, then this um, dynamics for the first vehicle, the environment, satisfies the assumptions. Right? And if we uh, push the first vehicle around for some L, we can check the trajectories and we can see that the spacing error E really nicely goes to zero as we expect. And that is exactly what was in the, in the guarantees. And so this illustrates uh, the, the type of reasoning that, that we would like to enable. Um, but we can take this one step uh, further because it's easy to show that this system sigma, uh, our, our, let's say our ego vehicle, also satisfies this contract. And this contract is really nothing more than saying that the kinematic relation also holds for our vehicle sigma. So this in, in turn means that sigma also satisfies the conjunction of these two contracts. And the first contract said it achieves a desired spacing with respect to the predecessor. The second contract says it satisfies the uh, kinematic relation itself. And of course, it then also satisfies this conjunction right? because we took the assumptions to be, to be the same. Which means that this second vehicle would again act as a relevant environment for a potential third vehicle, uh, which we can formalize using this, uh, this condition uh, that we had to check for, for series interconnection. But this means that for maybe a third vehicle, we could do exactly the same uh, procedure, meaning that we've now obtained a fully modular design of vehicle controllers. Uh, so for a single, vehicle, we only need to look at its respective contract. Um, and with this, um, I arrive at, at the conclusion. So I've introduced behavioral assume guarantee contracts motivated by contract theories from computer science uh, with notions of implementation, refinement, and conjunction, and um, notions of, of composition. And together, they enable this modular reasoning, right, where uh, we had this separation of, of concerns. Um, I think this is what, uh, what I had here. Yeah. So these behavioral assume guarantee contracts, they allow for expressing rich specifications. That's something different from dissipativity theory or, or steady invariance. And it supports this modular analysis and design because it really formalizes the separation of concerns, right? So I need to design local components with respect to local contracts only. 
And then the integration is done on contract level. And of course, this also enables the replacement of components. So if I now would like to replace my system of my component Sigma 1, my component Sigma 1 prime, the only thing I need to do is check whether Sigma 1 prime satisfies uh, its respective contract. Right? So I don't need to do a complete uh, reanalysis of the entire integrated system. Um, so, uh, okay, this also instantiates this, this method theory. Um, so I really view this as, um, well, the first steps in, um, in, the, in this domain. Um, and there's a lot of, of future work. So one thing that we're currently working on are, uh, are, are two things. Um, first of all, we try to use a notion of simulation as a notion of system comparison, rather than this behavioral inclusion, because this notion of simulation has the advantage that it's computationally much more uh, effective. Um, we have looked at something similar using uh, uh, linear programming. Um, so all that I presented so far was very much bottom up. Uh, so given local specifications, what can we say about global ones? Of course, ultimately, we would like to go top down as well and maybe start with a global specification, divide this over um, local specifications or components, and then do controller design or uh, system design on the basis of, of this. Um, with this, I would like to, uh, to close. We have a few uh, references on this, but I can point you to, uh, to some more in case you're interested. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark, for the great talk. Um, Thanks. Let's open the stage for questions. Uh, you can either write them in the chat and I will read them for you or raise your hand and I will call you. Okay, Drele, if uh, you don't mind, I will start. Go, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Um, you know, thank you, Bart. Uh, you know, first of all, this is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, reminds me a lot of the work that we're also doing for, you know, <laughs> other things. Now, this is one, one of the things that I was wondering about is how essential is linearity uh, in this work, in the sense that is it a convenience in this that you know if you if you have all the properties in a system then a lot of things are just easier for you to do or is it essential um or what is the you know if you what is the less strict requirement that that you that you need to impose on the underlying systems so um i think that the general definition of contract would immediately carry over to, to nonlinear systems as well. Um, we, however, exploit linearity heavily <laughs> to make it operational, uh, to obtain all the necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, we've so far not looked into, into the nonlinear case uh, yet. Uh, my, well, my, my initial um, uh, guess would be that Indeed, these type of definitions and this type of reasoning still carries over, um, but it will be very difficult to obtain necessary sufficient conditions. And we typically, uh, I guess, we would have to settle for for sufficient conditions, which is maybe fine. Um, but um, at the moment, we don't have any any theory or, or any tools uh, available for this. Right, because I, I was thinking that uh, about that. Um, uh, actually, looking at your your example with the platooning or the car following, right? As you can imagine, I work on those kind of things, but extensively. Um, now, requiring that the following distance is linear in the speed doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? So probably what you want is something that where, where the distance is more proportional to the square of the mm -hmm. speed. And I am wondering, so this is not an arbitrary no linearity, right? But it's something that has some kind of like a monotonicity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking to what extent some monotonicity constraint on the behaviors in a sense mm -hmm. could replace the linearity. Kind of kind of conditions. So, you know, I mean, I understand that you know you cannot answer now, right? But uh, no, that's an interesting thought. So, in in 
in general, what, what we do in this behavioral approach, of course, is that we use these linear behaviors to, to represent classes of, of signals that we allow somehow. And so classes of signals U that, that we allow and classes of, of signals UY that we allow in, in the guarantees. And you, at least on a conceptual level, there's no reason why these, these sets of allowed trajectories should necessarily be, well, should necessarily correspond to, to linear systems, other than that in this case, it was very convenient for us to, to work with. Right, right, right. And you might have you need other types of, of characterizations. Um, uh, and maybe monotonicity could, could be helpful there. Yeah, but I, I, I do not immediately have, um, have a clear picture on, on what right, right, right. I'm think. not expecting you to right but uh, okay. just as a, <laughs> but, but this, this is the way I, I would I would view it that um, in, in principle so the, the thing with this contract theory is um, the more abstract you make it the easier it becomes <laughs> somehow um, and for us the difficulty was really in making it it operational um, yeah. and yeah. that's where linearity uh, uh, helps a lot. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I need to think a little bit about how this uh, operationalization, uh, how do you say, <laughs> yeah. how to make it operational with this. With this okay, but anyway, thank, thank you, Bart. Yeah. Thanks. I'll let other people also ask their questions. Thank you, Emilio. Uh, so there is a, in the chat, Arsh asked a question. How strict is time invariance to this formulation? Um, yeah, I think I think it's a similar uh, similar answer. Um, maybe in this specific case, uh, as far as I know, this entire behavioral systems theory is well. I'm I'm inclined to say only developed for linear time invariant systems, but I have to be a bit careful. At least the, the theory is much more developed for the linear time invariant case. Um, so this is something that, um, uh, yeah, again, that, that helps a lot in, in finding conditions that you can actually check. Okay, Ash, if it's uh, answering question or not, simply follow up on the chat. In the meanwhile, I, I also have a question, which is, uh, oh, yeah, Ash says, okay, thanks. Um, is um, I, I was really interested in the in all the comparisons you were showing the fact that this is a great tool for comparing contracts and so on. And my question is, um, have you thought about uh, applications similar to the ones you mentioned in the literature review for, for instance, system design? People such as Nuzzo or San Giovanni Vicentelli, in which you are you are looking for. Uh, the combination of minimal contracts in the sense of these partial orders when you do system design. So assume that now for each one of these blocks you have, you have a variety of contracts mm -hmm. that uh, arise from uh, different designs, you know, controlled designs or even placement of sensors, whatever it is. Now, uh, have you ever thought about formulating the problem of finding the minimum set of the minimum the, the set of minimal contracts? With respect to a certain cost function, such that your design is uh, optimal in a sense. Yeah, that, that's that's a very uh, that's a very nice question. Um, so the I think the the the, the quick <laughs> the quick answer is no. Um, in a sense that we don't have anything on this. It is something that's in the back of my mind and something that I would like to work uh, towards because this is a very relevant question. Whether you can bring some notion of of performance or optimality uh, into this in, in this design. Um, and for me, this is very much tied to, to this top-down problem where you start with an overall specification that you would like to split into, into multiple specifications. And a priori, yeah, there's possibly uh, many, many ways of, uh, of doing this. And this approach that you suggest where maybe for each of the components, you have a limited number of, of contracts available, could make this, this tractable uh, indeed. Exactly. Uh, maybe another exactly. approach could be to have contracts that are, in, that are in some sense parameterized. And you want to 
I don't know, find the the, the set of, of joint parameters such that yeah, that guarantee um, a satisfaction of the overall contract and then work on work with these parameters. That is something that we've started thinking about a little bit, but we don't have any results on this uh, on this yet. That's that's very interesting. I'm happy to follow up offline because uh, I think it's it relates to some part of my work and it's very cool. Very cool. I'm very interested in, in discussing this uh, this further and learn nice. more about your work as, as well. Yes, that, that's great. Okay, let's see. Uh, do we have any other question from the audience? Mm, doesn't seem so. Well, if you happen to reason and have questions later, I think, Bart, you left your contact somewhere. Maybe it was in the title page. I don't remember. Uh... Uh, I'm also happy to, uh, to stay around for uh, for a few more minutes if people want to just chat informally uh, a bit. Okay, sounds good. Then I'll officially say if you want to stay, okay, uh, people, okay. But I'll officially thank you again for for the time, and um, and see you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Thanks.